So in this video, we're going to look at one of the two most common prompts for the uh, paired passages or cross-text connection questions, and that is the uh, response question type, where they ask you how the author of one passage, usually passage two, would respond to something in passage one. And now in terms of strategy, I wish there was some fancy trick I could uh, share with you, but really it's just a matter of sort of breaking things down into parts and being careful in reading. And so let's just look at these examples, starting with this one. How would the author of text two respond to the overall argument presented in text one? And so that means that the first thing we wanna do is read text one and make sure we understand the overall argument. And in doing so, we'll try to summarize that argument in a few words. So it says, photography cannot be considered fine art because it relies on a mechanical process rather than the subjective skill of the artist. A painter or sculptor must carefully craft each detail by hand, exercising his or her creativity and technique, while a photographer simply points the camera and presses a button. Although photographers may choose their subjects, the bulk of the work is done by the camera's machinery, rendering photography more a matter of documentation than artistic creation. Okay, so in a few words, our anonymous author here is saying that photography is not art because uh, it is machine made instead of human made. So how many words is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. So three to five words. It often ends up being more like six or seven, but it's a good goal. Okay, and so how would the author of passage two respond to that? So it says, photography's artistry does not depend solely on manual skill, so they're acknowledging that manual skill isn't really a part of it, but they're going to argue that uh, instead it emerges from the photographer's ability to select meaningful subjects, compose a visually engaging scene, manipulate lighting, and evoke emotions and ideas through the careful framing of each shot. A camera is a tool no different in principle from a painter's brush or a sculptor's chisel. Just as a great painting or sculpture captures and communicates a vision of the world, a thoughtful photograph can do the same. Therefore, photography deserves its place among the fine arts. So, photography is art. And we could elaborate on that. Uh, photography is art because reasons. Okay. <laughs> because reasons. The reasons that they give. In other words, it's, it's the fact that it doesn't depend on manual skill doesn't mean that it's not art to use a sort of double negative. Now, when we get to the answer choices, we can begin filtering in terms of uh, overall agreement or disagreement. And given that there is an overall disagreement here, answer choices that signal agreement can be quickly eliminated. If it's a typical question, we might have a couple left over that we need to scrutinize a little bit more closely, but let's see here. Answer choice A, by asserting that photographs can only be considered art if photographers produce them without any mechanical assistance. No doesn't say that at all. It says that the artistry doesn't depend on manual skill and that the mechanical assistance is something that uh, other art forms also uh, involve, right? Painting requires a brush, sculpting requires a chisel, etc. So it's not going to be A. B, by arguing that the creativity and vision involved in composing a photograph is as integral or integral to artistic creation as the craftsmanship involved in painting or sculpting. And that's essentially saying what we have here, you know, in so many words. Let's check the others though. By acknowledging that photography is a purely documentary practice, nope, because that would signal or suggest that it is not art. It is saying it has other value, but it's saying it's not art. And so that would really mean that they are agreeing with the author of passage one, and that's not what we have here. And then by agreeing that photographers rely too heavily on the camera's machinery. Nope. And so in this case, we really just have one that signals the sort of overall disagreement between the two passages. And so maybe we can consider this one a little more basic example. And I'll note that uh, in subsequent videos, I will have some more challenging ones. But here, I just want to sort of get the basic approach uh, down or get that across. So let's look at one more here. In this one, we have a slightly modified prompt. How would Mendez and her team, so not the author of text two, but some people mentioned in text two, respond to 
well, not the overall argument in text one, but the conventional thinking discussed in text one. So that means that our first step here is to really zero in on the conventional thinking, what is involved in that, before we get into text two. So text one says that our uh, agricultural scientists have long puzzled over how, how it is that numerous species of flowering plants can coexist within the same orchard environment, apparently vying for identical resources such as light and nutrients. So conventional thinking suggests that one species should dominate by outcompeting the others. Yet, despite extensive research, no clear explanation has emerged to clarify why so many flowering species persist side by side. Okay, so the conventional thinking is that one species should outcompete the others. Did I spell that right? Even with my scribbling, <laughs> one species should outcompete others. So, how would the author, or how would Mendez and her team respond to that conventional thinking? So, text two, Botanist Claire Mendez and her team have proposed that this puzzle can be resolved by considering the spatial arrangement and reproductive strategies of flowering plants. Because these plants rely heavily on pollinators like bees and butterflies to reproduce, their interactions with one another are often indirect. Each plant's reproductive success depends more on the activity of these pollinators than on directly competing for resources with other plants. Thus, the conventional view that the plants are engaged in intense resource competition may be misleading. In reality, their coexistence may hinge on the complex dynamics of pollination rather than head-to-head -head struggles over nutrients or sunlight. And so the idea here is that, well, according to these, uh, according to botanist Clara Mendez and her team, they don't, they, meaning the uh, different plants, don't actually compete. So that's kind of a built-in assumption that is sort of at the root of the puzzle here. They're competing. Why isn't one out competing the others? Well, here they're saying, eh, we need to really rethink this at a, maybe a deeper level. They're not actually competing for the same resources. And so we go to our answer choices by arguing that conventional thinking overlooks the crucial role that pollinators play in plant reproduction. We might put a question mark there. It doesn't explicitly say that they don't actually compete, but the reliance on pollinators is what makes their interactions indirect as opposed to direct. Actually, we can probably take away that question mark. I think that one is going to be correct. But as always, we want to check the others and see if we can find three incorrect answers to support our thinking that this would be correct. So B, by asserting that the regular influx of nutrients negates the need for direct competition among plant species. And so that could support this brief summary. That could support the point here that they don't actually compete. But if we scrutinize answer choice B, I think we'll find that that's not supported. It, I don't think it really says anything about a regular influx of nutrients into the soil. It really talks more about the pollinators. So I think we can go ahead and cross that one out. By suggesting that the conventional thinking accurately describes some orchard environments but fails to account for seasonal changes, well, that would suggest a basic overall agreement, which we really don't have. And I don't see anything at all about seasonal changes. And then D, by stating that the conventional thinking correctly identifies the main mechanism by which a single plant species comes to dominate. And so a couple of things wrong with that. One is that it would signal an agreement between the two passages. But the second thing is that it's characterizing the first passage uh, incorrectly because the first passage is not saying that one species dominates. It's asking why one species doesn't dominate. And so our correct answer there would be A. So again, nothing fancy here in terms of, you know, super top secret strategies. We just want to be careful in reading, read the prompt, and then use that to help us zero in on what it is in the first passage that we want to focus on. In this case, the conventional thinking. In this case, the overall argument. And then likewise, in terms of text two, is it going to be the author of text two, or is it going to be someone mentioned in text two? 
Occasionally they'll ask you how the author of text 1 would respond to something in text 2. I would still go ahead and read them in order because a lot of times text 1 is going to give you some background information that you need to understand uh, text 2. But anyway, uh, I will have a separate video talking about agreement questions. In other words, questions that ask about something that the two authors would agree on or figures mentioned the two passages might agree on. Then I'll have an additional video getting into some slightly more challenging examples of each type.